All right, everybody, we've got another interview here, and I'm really excited for this one. Uh, we are joined today by Dan John, who is a strength coach extraordinaire, one of my favorite thinkers and writers, and I've been massively influenced by him, both in my personal training, but also in my philosophy in life, and also in the way that I interact with clients. I mean, he strength coaches people, but and I life coach people, but there's a surprising number of parallels. So to tell you a little bit about Dan, he has spent his life with one foot in the world of lifting and throwing and the other in the foot and other foot in academia. He's an all-American discus thrower. Dan has also competed at the highest levels of Olympic lifting, Highland Games, and the weight pentathlon, an event in which he holds the American record. Dan spends his life or spend his work life blending weekly workshops and lectures with full-time writing and is also an online religious study instructor for Columbia College of Missouri. As a Fulbright spot scholar, he toured the Middle East exploring the foundations of religious education systems. Dan is also a senior lecturer for St. Mary's University at Twickenham, London. And he's read a, written a bunch of books. I've read most of them, and I'm definitely going to read the rest of them. But the final thing before I let Dan actually talk is I want to read you his email signature because it kind of struck me. He says, <clears throat> make a difference, live, love, laugh. Balance work, rest, play, and pray. Enjoy beauty and solitude. Sleep soundly. Drink water. Eat veggies and protein. Walk. Wear your seatbelt. Don't smoke. Floss your teeth. Put weights overhead. Pick weights off the floor. Carry weights. Reread great books. Say thank you. So that's the kind of wisdom you can expect from Dan. Dan, thank you for joining us. <laughs> that's, uh, somebody asked me to summarize my... Uh, my lessons of my 62 years uh -huh. and I thought that 50 words uh, was so that's 50 words. Okay. That's yeah. Si I, 62 years, 50 words. Yeah. Now there was a very bold statement in there, which was eat veggies and protein. I was actually kind of surprised you put anything about diet in there. Has anyone challenged you on that one yet? You know, <laughs> I feel bad for the nutrition people because God, nowadays, no matter what you say, you know, you're, you, you, uh, yeah, I eat, uh, you know, I eat eggs for breakfast. Oh, you kill puppies too? Well, <laughs> Not I, exactly. I, I don't know. How to, you, know I, you know, there's words that can the disconnect. I mean, I mean, I, I feel, I do, I feel for nutritionists. Uh, you know, I got, I work with a couple. Mark Halpern has this funny little thing. If it's real quick, he got, he's got this little arrow and it goes like this. Okay. And on the far left of the arrow, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's cookies, soft drinks, uh, pizza. Uh -huh. And the far right of the arrow is the perfect diet. And he says, the key to nutrition is this, finding where you need to be on the arrow. And he says an interesting thing. People who have never exercised or trained and they're morbidly obese are convinced they can go to perfection next, well, this week because it's the, the new year. Right. And uh, so I, I just feel for those guys. And it uh, doesn't a week go by without something opposite. <sighs> I know. And, I know. Uh, if you want to talk nutrition, one of the things I try uh, is Mark. Uh, Mark, I'm struggling. Yes. Down. Uh, Mark <laughs> is, I, and I apologize for that. But one of the things, Mark, is that whenever I hear about a magic food, mm -hmm. I try to step back and look at what they're so – the, real two, the two of my favorites are coffee and red wine. And when they try to get to coffee and they say, well, you know, that's that oil, that blue, green, gold oil that gets on – if you've ever been at – drank coffee at church is that bluish greenish weird color right. that supposedly has all the antioxidants that will you know make you live the 300 years of age huh. you know, the body of a 12 year old but when they put it in a pill it doesn't work or when they got red wine they say oh it's this thing or that thing my theory on all foods is this is this like if you're having a bad day mark i'd say let's go get a cup of coffee or right. you come over and we'll play some yahtzee and we'll drink a bottle of red wine Right. What I think is the secret of longevity with coffee and red wine is the is the communal aspects of it. Mm -hmm. And the foods that you shove down your throat by yourself in your car between errands is very uncommunal. And that's that's my thing about nutrition. If, yeah. If, that, that's it's an interesting point. I think there's a lot of things like that where it's much bigger than the specifics. Like, for example, with, you know, looking at something even like like nutrition, it's like, 
I don't know how much is what you eat so much as how you even eat it. Like what you think about, like I, so that's why I say, say grace, at least put yourself in a good state of mind before you do it. And like, think about stuff like even cigarettes. Like I think, you know, some people, they go crazy after they smoke or quit cigarettes because I think they're addicted to going outside, breathing deeply and having a little break in the day. And I think that in itself is very healthy. You know, that was my podcast <clears throat> last week where I'm, I don't, I'm oh. telling you not to smoke. Right. But yeah, how do you get into the smoking uh, community at your work? Uh, by smoking. That's it. You're right. in. And uh, I think sometimes, I think we're, we're very communal a animals. We really are. Um, you know, my dog was just up here a minute ago and I had to push him down. He, he'll, otherwise he'll put his nose up and he'll click the whole time. And, you know, the way we are with dogs, you know, we, we, the, the, the family nature of us. Um, I was just reading an article about this philosophy professor, how concerned he is about his students now because they cannot make it through a class without going onto their phone to either check in, sound in, shop, mm. buy things. And, and he says the key to philosophy is, is well, and you said it a few minutes ago, is the ability to handle solitude. Right. You've got to have a moment where you – so that's weird. I just said opposite things, but they're true. You, you need to have moments of community, but you also need to have moments of solitude and get, uh, be a, being able to handle both, I think, is a sign of a, a well-rounded human person. Well, it's interesting you say that, I think, because so much of life seems to be about learning how to balance contrasts rather than to live entirely in the black or in the white. And uh, that's part of what your philosophy in general about all this kind of stuff has you know, been so appealing to me. So yeah. if you will, like, here's a question I was thinking of is like, if you were going like one, how would you summarize what you could maybe call fit a magazine rack fitness? You know, like you, you, you pick up a magazine like men's yeah. health or whatever, and you look at that, how would you summarize that versus your approach? Well, I, I used to write for, I, I still kind of still do. And I don't like the way they edited me. Uh, and one of the reasons I don't like it is they don't, um, there's a Who's great, this? uh, a mag the famous magazines. I've read okay. all the famous fitness magazines. I've been in them. And, uh, there was a, there was a joke, uh, in a movie years ago where the guy wrote for people magazine. He said, my job is to write an article lo as long as the net average American's bowel movement. And, <laughs> and I thought to myself, when I read some of the magazines, it's like, that's what you read in an airport on an airplane. It's, right. it's just, it's the problem with the magazines is, you know, they'll have a fashion ad in one place, a car ad in the next place. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. They're trying to make money. And I get that. Right. But, and it's, and it's house crazy. And it's, it's always new. It's always fresh. It's always you right. know, ping, 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 ping. It's what, uh, it's, it, I, you know, I, I have an Instagram account, but it's what Instagram does. It's always right. ping, 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 something new. Here you go. Here's. Here's this, here's that. And you know, I appreciate that. I, I do. Because I think sometimes you've got to sell. Like if I'm coaching a football team, I've got to sell young men to run as fast as they can headlong into another human being. <laughs> and that is that's kind of the exact opposite of how we're wired. Right. So I get sometimes you have to have the flash and the, and, and the lights and all that. M my work, one of the things that I'm very interested in is my legacy. And I know that sounds, uh, that sounds so strange, but I, I don't know if you read my book, 40 years uh, with the whistle, but in that book and the thing everyone tells me about the thing they like about the book is they say, it's a love affair to my mentors. Hmm. That I got this great information from this person in 1971, 74, 78, 79, whatever. And I Shouldn't have taken the, I should have taken the advice better then, but I still learned the lessons and applied them later. So my work is really what, what I try to do is I don't want the work out of the day. I want the, I want the, I want the big picture of a lifetime. I, I, you know, I'm a grandfather, but I'm still the first people person people call when they're moving because mm -hmm. I, I can move couches, man. I can move couches backwards up a flight of stairs. And that's part of what I want my legacy to be. Uh, I want, and so when I when I write, one of the things I try to write is 
these are those these points these principles are true in finance these are in in food food preparation they're true in fitness they're true in performance they're true in your family life they're true with how you deal with your friends uh one of the overriding principles i believe in is little and often over the long haul i beat that phrase to death but if you want to have an emergency fund financially you put a little bit away until you have the fund if you want to have a you want to have great kids. You can't have great kids on a th three days a year. You take them to a, a, an amusement park and you're with them 24 hours a day right. and ignore them the other 362, 363 days a year. It's got to be a little bit often over the long haul. And so that's, I think you asked me to discern the difference and yeah. that's the best I can do. I really like that. Like, one of the things that I, I harp on a lot, mostly because I've been so guilty of disobeying it, is that like most of us know, or with minimal research, could find a pretty sure plan that'll get us to where we want to go. The problem is that the plan's not quite fast enough or sexy enough or give us enough things at once. And so it's like, I feel like the part of the reason why we're so stuck on the novelty of the next big thing, the next hack, the next fad or whatever, because we think maybe this time I'll be able to get it all real quick, real easy. And we just keep, I think that's what we are. I think we're suckers for that sell. And that's how people sell. It's like, this is going to do everything for you. And like, like, I don't know if you, you, you follow Dragon Door or on Dragon Door's mailing list, they released the, they got this ISO chain thing coming out. Do you see that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And like, they're marketing it like it's the next kettlebells. And I'm like, Maybe, but like also, I'm so weary of that pitch that I immediately wanted to just get off the mailing list. Now, I'm also at the same time thinking about how I could make one of those, but like. <laughs> okay, for, okay for, here's the deal. I, when I first started lifting, isometrics was still discussed mm -hmm. and that disappeared. And then when I got in trouble as a lifter, we went back to Bill March's functional isometric contractions and it changed my career. In hmm. fact, Bill sent me, um, oh, I wish I'd have known this was going to happen. Bill sent me a bunch of autographed pictures of himself because he knew that I was, a, 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 in love with what he did, but also I'm a bit of a weightlifting historian. So isometrics work right. for six weeks. <laughs> Just like everything, right? You know, and I hate to be such a jerk about it, but, you know, we use isometrics to change, to improve your throwing techniques or your, your football techniques. Mm -hmm. I'll put you in a position, hold it there until your nervous system and you realizes that this is where you want to be, mm -hmm. not, you know, this. So, but you're right. And, it, uh, and it, people t t say that, oh, the kettlebell was invented in 1998. I've got strength and health magazines through the fifties and sixties. And I got all of Sig Klein's kettlebell workouts. Mm -hmm. And he has one where he arm wrestles with the kettlebell. It was a, it was a style of, I would not, folks, don't do this at all. But you take a kettlebell and you practice your arm wrestling with it. And as I do that, of course, with my throwing shoulders, that's like, you, know, you stop doing that, son, you know. Uh, <laughs> but you're right. And, and, and I was just reading, uh, when I go on Facebook, I get this ad for this guy who promises after a certain age to have the best waistline of your life. And I went into, uh, and, I, and I typed in his workout, and I, I put the word uh, scam behind it. And it's, he's, everywhere you can find it is all one-star reviews out of five. Mm -hmm. You know, it's $22 when you buy it, but immediately you get hit with $97 upsells. And, oh, by the way, if you don't have his magic supplements, the program doesn't work. Ah, uh, always a catch like that, right? And you just, you, you, after a while, that's, it's interesting because, one of the guys online I like a lot is Greg O'Gallagher with Kino Body. And I do too. People, a lot of people just hate him. In fact, there's, <laughs> they use a lot of words, rude words about him. But I'm like, the guy, he's, I, I, I hate the word hack. I hate the word hack. I, I cannot believe we, how with mastery can you use the word, I'm going to hack climbing, um, um, you know, K2. Right. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'm going to hack. Uh, you know, uh, don't worry, guys. I know we're going to the bottom of the ocean at the Marianas Trench, and we saved a lot of money on steel by going with this aluminum. Yeah, good plan. Good, good plan. Right. But uh, I think Greg did a nice job with saying 
this, this, and this work. Let's take those three seri things see, seriously. See, as, as a, you know, as a throws coach, Coach Mom told me in 19, uh, it would have been the fall of 1977, he goes, I asked him, what's the secret to being a great thrower? And he said, lift weights three days a week, throw the discus four days a week for the next eight years. Right. He just hacked discus throwing for all your audience for you. But, <laughs> but the audience misses that last little line for the next eight years. Right. And so that's Always looking for something faster, right? And, and by the way, I thought that was fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, coming from the the perspective of someone who trains Olympians and whatnot, it's like eight years, great deal, right? Sign <laughs> me up. <laughs> right. Well, I think it's it's challenging, especially people who are in the sphere of content creation, because it, like Gregor Gallagher is an interesting example because. The information is solid. It works. I've had, I've done the program. Um, I, rem I actually remember you you in, uh, endorse, endorsing it at one point. Like it's good stuff, but the problem is the marketing is done very marketingly, which is like on one hand it sells, it makes money. You can't tell, you can't deny he's profitable, but at the same time, it almost automatically removes a sense of authority and trust for a lot of people and makes people really loathe you. And so it's like, as a creator, like you've gone much softer on the marketing. And I imagine you could sell more things if you wanted to, if you pushed harder, but at the same time, it's hard to do that because people, they tell you, stop this. I don't like this. I don't, and it, and it feels bad. It's like, well, I want people to take me seriously. I want people to know I'm not just a huckster. And it's it's a difficult thing. I'd like to know what you think I do that's marketing, because this would be good. Mm -hmm. I need to share this. <laughs> well, it was more the, the, the lack of marketing and the fact that uh, you at least have some links on your website, I would say. Yeah, so my, uh, <laughs> it's like my Instagram account. Uh, you know, I have pictures of my daughter's wedding, uh, my dog with a pair of glasses on him. And of course, you know, and the, the thing for me, and I, it is, I do, I, I have to say this, I, I live in a different environment than a lot of these poor guys and, and girls. I, I don't, I don't have to, I don't have to worry about my mailing list. I don't have to worry about, uh, oh my God, the book didn't sell, you know, mm -hmm. I can't buy groceries. So I have to have a little bit of empathy for why some people do that. Now, at the same time, I also should be allowed to say to them, your message, you know, Earl Nightingale, that great, the great, the, the great speaker, you know, he, in his wonderful uh, audio collection called Lead the Field, said, if you want to make money, forget making money and serve people. Right. And it's weird because it was only a few years ago that I realized that the money I make doing this particular part of my life is because I give away so much of it for free. I try mm -hmm. to serve. Um, I will call you know, like for today I was offered money to help this guy do this goal. I called him up on the phone. He had a number. I said, if you can't take your money, let me help you. You know, uh, that doesn't, that doesn't make me mother Teresa or anything. I'm just saying that I'm in a, I'm in a place where it's much more important for me to, to, to help others. And again, don't gentle listener, don't lose your mind. Don't roll your eyes. I actually believe what I just said. No, I, I believe you too, because you, you know you, you follow the the model of put enough good stuff out, good stuff's gonna happen. I mean, oh. you know that's that's more or less what I've tried to do too. And it's like people ask me uh, sometimes, like how, like what should I do? I want to I want to work for myself. I want to go into business. And I tell them, find a problem you really care about, and then work hard to try and solve that problem. And people who have that problem, they'll pay you. <laughs> And it's like, as long as you like follow that basic formula, you're going to do all right. I think, you know, well, it's, it's interesting. I, I had a, we had a delightful brunch this morning. So we worked out and it was nice because one of my former assistants came to brunch. I haven't seen him. Well, I've seen him, but we haven't really had a chance to sit down in almost a decade. He's a, he's an outstanding American football coach, great person, played in division one, real big time guy. And we were just kind of sitting around laughing about, Kind of honestly, what you just talked about, it was just, we used to have this joke because as a head coach, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. Mm -hmm. You know, don't wait until I've got 25 seconds to make a call and say, oh, Bobby's leg's broken. Oh, 23, 22. What? <laughs> Instead say, you know, Henderson, get in there. 
don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. And it's when, when you're in charge of something, you will raise up all the solutioners. And I would circle with a big red pen. I don't have a red pen. This is, but I would have a red, an actual red, circle all the names of all the people who bring problems with them and do your best to get them out as fast as you can. Right. Bring, right. bring the solutions. Right. Because when you're in the business of solving problems, well, then, you know, people who just create more of them are kind of, they're kind of going against the flow there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's so, great advice. That's great. Advice. Thank you. Um, so, question for you. All right. If I'm trying to get, you know, my guy, one of the big things for my guys is I, I say you need to have fitness in your life. Um, it's just one of the most basic routines that balances your mind, your body, your spirit. You got to get it in there. And so I'm always trying to give them, you know, some basic advice about how to, about how to go about it. So what should I tell them? Like, do you need to throw up every workout or just most of them? Never. <laughs> Never. No. Well, that, that seems counterintuitive according to our, our current culture. Yeah. And it's, and it's wrong. Um, you know, we know <laughs> it's weird, but if, if you really want, if you, if you wake up obese one day, the smartest thing you can probably do is get yourself at a trailhead and go on a three month hike. Uh, that will, that will do more for you. Uh, we've known for a long time that long, uh, that walking might be the very best thing you can do. I got Steve mm -hmm. McGill's book right there in my shelf, The Gift of Injury. And one of my favorite parts of the book is when the guy who's hurt says this famous line that he made his best progress when he started walking 10 minutes before every meal. Mm -hmm. Eat three times a day, that's 30 minutes. Yeah. That's not very much. Um, so for me, I, I would much prefer you set aside about, oh, I don't know, 10 to 15 minutes to do some kinds of resistance strength work. And really it should just be the, make them as big as you can. You know, I mean, boy, I tell you, I had, I have this great little workout I do where I do a goblet squat for eight, push a prowler, do eight push ups, And then we do depending on when we do that five times, 10 times, or like I did on Monday and I'm still walking funny 20 times, but You'll, you'll look at that, and when I tell you that at first, you're like, well, that's just not that big a deal. Right, but the benefits are amazing. So if you can just find yourself, I would say three to four to five exercises in that ballpark, you do a round or two of each of them, uh, you go for a walk, uh, fat loss happens in the kitchen, you know, uh, eat, one of the things, one of my goals every day is eat eight different vegetables every day, eat eight different, not eight, servings but eight mm -hmm. and then of course drink this stuff called water by the way folks this is a plastic this comes from the american red cross i usually don't drink out of plastic but they gave it to me i will make sure i drink out of this bottle for days okay <laughs> don't want to ruin the environment <laughs> very nice yeah for those of you who who didn't uh, we weren't here on the, the pre-call. Dan gave some uh, some blood today. So he was telling me you were telling me a little bit about some of the benefits of giving blood. Because I want to oh. I want to circle back to what you're saying, but but say that again because I hadn't heard that before. For, for for a male, probably the healthiest thing you can do for yourself. There's probably two things for your heart health that will are game changers. One is floss your teeth twice a day. I was gonna ask you about that. What's the deal with that? Why does that help? Well, it's point your point your mouth like this. Okay, go like that. Uh -huh. That infection there, every time your heart beats, that infection goes around your entire body. So if your heart beats at 64 beats a minute, like mine did right before they draw, took my blood, 64 times a minute, that infection goes through my entire uh, uh, cardiovascular system. <laughs> so the gums, the gums lead right to the heart. So number <laughs> one, floss your teeth. Number two, if, especially if you're male, donate blood as often as appropriate as you can. I do this thing called double red. So, um, so I give two full units of blood and then they give me my plasma back three times a year. It, but it means I can't give blood now until late April. I mean, it is, but there's a thing called hematocrit. Now, if you're a long distance runner or a cyclist, uh, the, the European cyclists, uh, the Tour de France, they all take this drug called EPO to raise your hematocrit. The problem with that is when your hematocrit levels get too high, and that's, there's a chance that you're you're doing, well, as the Dr. Eads one time said, 
all that iron begins to rust out your blood, your, your bloodstream. You get rusty. And so bringing those hematocrit levels down uh, does a lot of good for your, for your own heart. Uh, the funny thing is I can always, I tell my wife weeks ahead of my blood donation, I know it's time for blood donation. I feel myself feel different. I feel much better at uh, 42, 43 versus 49. Uh, so folks, and I know, but here's the thing. I guarantee every, every listener knows they should floss. I, I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Yeah. Do they floss? <laughs> so to make sure I floss, I keep floss sticks in the driver's side well of my car. So I floss quite a bit when I'm driving around doing small errands. I floss on the way to the gym. Often I'm flossing the way home too. We all know you're supposed to floss, but now you have to build it into a system. Yeah. Um, I, my dentist says I should do it in this order. I should floss, brush my teeth, and then uh, mouthwash. Um, I, I, I like mouthwashing first, but that's my own thing. But you know, you all know you're supposed to uh, uh, floss, but you don't do it. You're, my, I go to my dentist three times a year when I discovered that uh, my dentist, every dentist recommends not twice a year, but three times. And I said, well, how much more is that third visit? He said, 47 bucks. That's a bar tab, man. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and, and it's funny cause I know this is, a, this is not a tangent. I, I gotta be careful. I was about to say it's a tangent, but when you talk to people about their physical health, always the questions I always ask are, are you drinking water? Are you flossing your teeth? Uh, when is your, when, when do you go to the eye doctor? When's your visit every year? Mine's always in December. Wh when's the next time you go into the dentist? When's your annual physical? And I, I ask these questions because if you're not taking care of those basic fundamental, it, it's like putting your seatbelt on every time you get in a car. If you're not doing that, why are we talking about burpees <laughs> or how much you snatch and clean a jerk? Uh, and, uh, and, and you said you said you spent a lot of time doing life coaching stuff, right? Right. How often does it come down to someone who's struggling because they try to skip over a foundational or a basic idea? Most, most times, I would say for sure. Like the the thing that is unique in my situation is that a lot of the stuff that I help people with has not yet become common knowledge. But outside of that kind of stuff, it's yeah, it's the basic. This is actually one of the main reasons why I'm such a fan of your work is that you trained me to look and really prioritize hammering the basics, hammering the fundamentals, because if those are not in place, then like you said, it's it's pointless to talk about some high level mindset work if you're sleeping four hours a night. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Or you want to talk about fat loss and you're not sleeping because and, and, and you know, I did a, a workshop and for these doctors up in Portland. It was kind of cool. It's kind of weird when you're, I'm kind of a big engine. Maybe it doesn't show up on the thing, but I'm a, you know, everyone in pictures, I tend to look like Shrek, you know, you know, kind of like, you know, all the villagers are chasing me with torches and pitchforks. And, and you got this one picture with me, these guys, and I just, you know, just so much bigger than these guys. <clears throat> but they all, many of the doctors came up and thanked me afterwards because I prioritize for performance, for advanced athletic performance, sleep first. Right. And then we talk about the building blocks of, I mean, obviously, you know, there's going to be some performance things that are important too, but let's hold on. <clears throat> but if you're not getting your veggies and you're not thinking about your longevity, you're not wearing your seatbelt. Why are we having this discussion about whether you should use the John Powell style on the discus, the Booger style, or the Mac Wilkins style, because <clears throat> if you get a tail, a, a, a quick little intersection hit could put you in the hospital for, you know, for day, years, you know? Right. You know? And it sounds weird when you first talk about it. And I get a lot of pushback from this, but I know it's right because I've seen it, you know? But right. Now let's talk about five sets of two. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's it's interesting because like you mentioned all these different like 
things you're talking about, like in terms of all right, you can do this kind of workout, and you can you know fat loss happens in the kitchen, and all of those things are you guys you don't know. Those are all systems that Dan has constructed and you know each one of those many of those things each have their own book like the the thing fat loss happens on monday that's a great book if you want to learn his fat loss methodology um like when he was talking about the the flossing on the side on the side of his car that's a system that's a habit system these are the kinds of things that i love because these are the things that are really transform it's like much of what i do is more or less willpower coaching is i teach people how to change a habit you know, and it's very difficult to do that. You need to optimize your willpower. And so in order to do that, we have to take your willpower out of all the things that we possibly can. So we have the highest budget of willpower to do the most important things. And so it's like you taught me that with training <laughs> because I always wanted to do it all. I always wanted to do fat loss. I wanted to do cardio. I wanted to do muscle building. I wanted to do strength. And I would like I was lucky because I had good genetics. I was young and I was right. uninjured up until a point and then you can't go any further and you know i it, it just alternated between stagnation and injury um and then i started finding your stuff and i was like shit i really gotta actually choose <laughs> you say this here's a simple thing i tell mike so when i mentor people in 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 the trainer world personal trainers mm -hmm. it's mostly fat loss one of the things i tell them to do is when you first get a client shake their hand and walk out to their car and look in the back seat of the car and then a good first thing to do is as you walk out, always have a trash bag and ask the person to declutter the backseat of the car, the window, well, you know, the wells, uh, <laughs> even straighten up the glove box. Because most people's lives are so messy and so cluttered. Um, they're, it, it's funny because it's going to go into the refrigerator. It's going to be the pantry. It's going to be there. <laughs> everything is just everything is. There's. 300 McDonald's bags in the back seat. And so every time you get in that car, it smells a terrible smell of old French fries. And yet that's hitting your brain though. Right. Your, your brain is collecting all this. So I agree with you. I think, I think one of the reasons so many people, and I do like free will. I do believe in free will. And I know I'm not supposed to, I read an article that said there's no such thing. So that has to be true. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm an absolute believer in free will. And I agree with you 100% because I think you only have so much. And if you've got two little girls barking at you, uh, you know, you're getting up. When my daughters were little and they were getting up and they didn't want to wear their uniforms and they didn't want to do this. And they were, nah, nah, nah. by the time I dropped them off at school, I was shattered sometimes. Now, fortunately, I had a nice little commute to get to work and I could reboot. Right. Uh, and I would, and I had, and, you know, I've, I learned to listen to books on tape, you know, Earl Nightingale, positive people, because I had to reboot after oh, yeah. them. And I got to tell you, uh, I, I don't, I don't know of a parent who's, who doesn't pray because you constantly say, thank God when your kids get out of the car or go to sleep or you anything like that. Sleep or <laughs> eat their food or put away their clothes. Uh, and so what happens is, you know, you got to look at your life. I'm not saying my kids are clutter. I didn't say that. But if you're getting barked at by all these things, all these, I wouldn't I hate to say they're unimportant things, but these things that are constantly shooting at you. I don't know if you know my system of shark habits and pirate maps, but mm -hmm. that's one big, okay. So shark habits is a phrase that comes from Rob Wolf. We do a lot of workshops together. And uh, you'll notice I almost always wear a black polo. Uh, because uh, I have 16 of this exact shirt. You know, why 16, do you ask? Because that's all they had in North America. I bought it. <laughs> and uh, when you email me, you notice the email right back? Yes. When you call me, I pick right up. Mm -hmm. uh, I answer every email. I answer every phone call. I answer everything. Because I get those out of my brain. This morning, I got my college class coming up. I did all the preliminary work for my college class. Well, I mean... I don't even know if the school is even open, but all the work is done hmm. because I want that out of my brain so I could talk to you on the phone. Right. When I go in to get a uh, blood donate, as I'm leaving, they say, do you want to set an appointment? You know what I say? Hmm. Yes. Yes, I do. Right. Because I don't want to clutter up my brain with when am I going back to the Red Cross? So a shark habit is one bite and it's gone. Hmm. One bite and it's gone. Like so for that. everything in my life that's not 
the goal I have, I shark have it. Oddly, I, sh I mean, for example, my daughter got married in June and I was having a conversation with this another young bride and I said, the biggest problem was the RSVPs, right? She goes, how did you know? Because every bride's number one problem is no one will fi fill out the RSVP. Right. Now, it's important that I do it. So I do it as fast as I can. Right. Uh, it, it made me very proud that my daughter's first three, first three RSVPs were my interns and, and my former assistants. Hmm. I love that. Well, let me ask you about, so I imagine the, the pirate map stuff, that's the longer term stuff that takes repeated effort, oh, right? So if you don't mind, you know, for example, yeah, the, back of my, uh, the back of my computer here is I have my daily pirate map. So you go to St. John's Island, you find the white coconut tree, you take seven paces to the west, you dig down, and there's the buried treasure. Mm -hmm. That's a pirate map. Right. Basically, I have a sleep ritual. When I wake up, I, I'm grateful. I do a one minute meditation uh, with a little thing on the app, an app called uh, One Moment Meditation. I do A, B, A, B, A, B workouts. Uh, three days a week, I work out over at Epic Fitness. Two days a week, I do another kind of workout. And then number five, I eat eight different vegetables a day. And the idea is this, if I focus on that process, day mm -hmm. in, day out, day in, day out, good things will happen. Now, I'm cheating a little bit on this, but in the past year, because I, I've had, I was born with a condition called pistol grip hips. So instead of having round hips, they were more like little stalks. Hmm. And so I've been, my hips have clipped since I can remember. And I always thought it was just normal. I didn't, when something happens to you all the time, it's just normal. Mm -hmm. my, my brother went to Vietnam and lost his hearing. So my home was very loud, but I never noticed it until I'd have friends come over and they say, why is it so loud? Well, because we have a deaf and, and you'd almost have to say, oh, that's right. We have a deaf person, <laughs> you know, yeah. so and so I had a, my so my right hip got replaced last year. And this past year, I've lost 36 pounds and 11 percent body fat. Now, most of it was because of the the law, the, 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 the inflammation all that pain, all the cortisol, you get rid of the cortisol in your body, it loves it. Mm -hmm. But it's also the fact that I got a good night's sleep. I would say in the last year, I probably had a couple nights that were bad, but the bulk were good. Right. I, even then, I still get up and I'm grateful. I eat eight different veggies every day. I work out three days a week over at Epic. I work out two days a week or more here at my house. You know, And you just keep stockpiling. So if it's your goal... And my goal is to dance at my granddaughter, uh, Josephine's wedding. Okay. She's five. I'm 64. <laughs> okay. Well, no one in my family makes it past, uh, we don't live long in my family. Either we die in America's wars or God bless my brother, Phil. Um, he, he, he died in a, in a bicycle accident in June, the week before my daughter got married, which was not great, but, mm. uh, we, we die young. And I tell people that and they always go, Ooh, ooh. but I'd like to make it into my 80s. Now, a lot right. of you listeners are going, 80s? I want to live to 100. And, yeah, well, that's great. Well, this year I celebrate the 40th anniversary of my mother's death. Right. We don't live long in this family. So for, for me, my pirate map is a longevity map with the best information I can do. Hmm. And I know that in 2020, if I have 366 good night's sleeps, I eat lots of vegetables, drink lots of water, donate blood, floss my teeth, Good things are going to happen. That's I can't guarantee it, but I'm I'm turning that Titanic. Right. Uh, I'm turning. It's, oh, there's an iceberg, fifty miles away. Let's. I'm I'm turning it at fifty miles away, not fifty feet away. Right. No, I, I love that. That that's the development of a solid system, and like you're focusing on the system and breaking it down into, you know, very doable habits that you know exactly what they look like when they occur and so it's completely executable now the problem like that people struggle with is that you know you're coming from a a background of a lifetime of self-development and discipline you know even just starting with with sports and you know how in the sports you were it forced you to learn how discipline worked and how to you know live in that like this is actually a question i wanted to ask you it's like if I could say that there is an evil that I fought in the world, it would be the evil of people being way too hooked into 
low value, high stimulation activity. And this yeah. is stuff like Netflix, porn, video games, the stuff that people spend hours and hours and hours and huge amounts of their neurochemicals on. And then it robs them of discipline and drive and motivation and all this kind of stuff. And so it's like, uh, how, if you've got any insights or thoughts about it, cause you're working with these people, you know, trying to help them build habits and stuff, but they're, they're inundated with all this, you know, attention, stealing, discipline, stealing, willpower, stealing activity. Do you have any tips for helping people starting to build healthy habits, trying to actually pull themselves out of that kind of, you know, the, the, the black hole of autopilot and into intentional living? Well, all I can do is, is, is say what I've learned from BJ Fogg, who I have great respect. That's he's tiny habits. Right. And one of the things I've learned from BJ Fogg is that you must, you must make your first set of, I'm going to change. I need to change a habit. Well, you're not going to be able to go on rabbit food and marathon training on day one, by the way, everyone thinks they can because everyone I've ever met has so much free will. I, I'm shocked. I'll be at I'll be at parties and some drunk will walk over to me and she will tell me how disciplined she is when she puts her mind to it. And I always wonder myself, where's your mind been for 40, 40 plus years? Because uh, you're not really showing me a lot of discipline. Right. Um, and, and, and then we contrast that with my athletes sometimes who will say, man, I had so much discipline in high school. Oh, oh did you? So tell me about the discipline you had. Who made you breakfast? Mom. Who made you lunch? School lady. Who made you dinner? Mom. Okay. What happened at three o'clock? I went out to practice. And what happened at practice? Uh, you yelled at me. Uh-huh. And uh, <laughs> I made you lift weights. I made you run hills. Yeah. Yeah. Would you, let's go back on all this discipline that you had. You know? Right. So to me, those are the you two. You just showed up. <laughs> that's the two seesaws that go on in my head all the time. Mm -hmm. So for me, the best thing you can do is at first, and, and, and it's okay to do the baby steps. And listen gentle listener, I know you don't believe me. I know you don't, but trust me, I'm right. Everybody wants to do the top secret gung ho burn before reading commando Navy seal green beret men's health ripped to shreds, you know, cut, cut like the loser in a team one, a knife fight workout. Truth is you might have to start off with, I'm going to put on my athletic shoes every day. And when I put on my athletic shoes, I'm going I'm to applaud myself and then take them off. That's week one. Right. Week two might be, I'm going to ask you to drink a glass of water every day and I'll call you at nine o'clock and the phone will ring because you're drinking that glass of water. I'm telling you folks, you want to make the smallest steps in the beginning you can. And I think you need to build on success. I th and what's weird is I did this when I finally trusted the process. This would now be almost 12, 13 years ago when I first did it the first time this way. I, uh, a person gave me a, some money and I said, I'm going to work with you for a year, but at any time you break my rules, I'm going to fire you and keep your money. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the first month, the guy had to drink two glasses of water a day. His goal was to lose a hundred pounds in a year. Mm -hmm. First month was drinking two glasses of water a day. Month two, he had to park his car. We found a place where he worked and the car the place he had to park was the most inaccessible from his office, the farthest space we could find. And I asked his coworkers, I said, listen, if he parks anywhere else, anytime, let me know I'm going to fire. At the end of the year, easily lost 100 pounds and decided halfway through the year to run a half marathon. And he did it on the year anniversary, 13.1. Because what he did is he was laughably successful every month. At the end of the by the time we got to about two weeks on every one of these things, he was like, hey, man, don't want to make a big deal, but I'm drinking I'm drinking a gallon of water a day. Well, good for you. You know, wait to wait, 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 throw that in my face. Right. And uh, pretty soon he found that that little walk made him want to walk a little bit more instead of doing my job and then, you know, crashing on the, the couch, you know, in the office or whatever he had. He just would go for more walks. And I think... I think we need to have, you know, I watch my grandchildren and my own children, but I remember my grandchildren better, learning how to speak English. They're learning how to speak. And they, even, let's go back even, learning how to walk. Um, for some reason in my family, 
we give our children a couple of years to learn how to master walking. I know it's going to surprise you. And we gave them a couple of years to learn objective pronouns versus uh, the other kind of pronouns, which just dropped out of my head. Uh, <laughs> sub subjective pronouns. <laughs> you know, we didn't ins insist right away that they have me, I, we, and us perfectly yet. And yet most of your listeners are convinced that if they don't turn things around in three days, that they're a failure. Folks, it's it's the process. At, in one, in what I, when I do my workshops, my number three point, uh, I'll give you number one in just a minute, is okay. fall, in love, fall in love with the process. The results will take care of themselves. You know, if you'd have told me a year ago today when I was still stoned as hell on painkillers, mm. uh, by now I was I'm probably doing better now. But I was still pretty. If you'd have told me a year later that I would feel this good and be this sore from doing 160 squats on Monday and 160 squats, uh, push-ups on Monday, and then a really hard butt workout on Tuesday, I'd have gone, <laughs> no way, man. But you give someone 365 days and, and miracles happen. And if you give someone eight years, miracles happen. And I just said the antithesis of everything you hear in the radio, the television, and the internet ads. You're 100% right. And it's the thing that I run into as a coach is like, you know, I tell them that like, all right, if, you, if we take our time with this, if we, you know, work by, you know, significant kind of quarterly, yearly kind of goals, you know, three years, you can have an entirely different life. Like you can be exponentially further away from where you're at. We can't do it in a couple of weeks though. And like the problem that I run into is often getting that buy-in initially because they're not excited enough about slow progress. And so usually what I have to default to is, all right, we'll try the fast way. All right, how fast do you want to go? All right, we'll do this fast. And then give them a couple of weeks of like complete failure. And then they're usually much more pliable and interested. And like, I wish there was a way around that. But I haven't quite found that yet. And, and even in my own self, like, you know, it, it took like the speaking of your quadrants, like people can can look this up or we can explain it. But you talk about the different quadrants of where you fall in your fitness. Right. And your main point is that most people not, not only main point, but one of your points is that most people fall in quadrant three where you have like a bunch of qualities relatively low level. Yeah. That sounded so unsexy and cool to me. It's just like, I was like, that's dumb. I'm not there. I can't put myself there. And like, I tried to train like I was, you know, in one of the elite categories, uh, either one. Can't help you. And, <laughs> and it didn't work. And I had to fail. And I had to go through it. And it's just like, is do you have any tricks for, for skipping, like, like inspiring people to skip that learning step? Or is it kind of just like, all right, I'll see you in a bit. Well, for me, I mean, the nice thing is, uh, like, you know, I've had people not do my method. I've read people tell, say horrible things about the way I do things on this thing called the interwebs. And it's funny that 10 years later, all of a sudden I became the same person. I'm a genius now. Now, it's the hard thing. I didn't change. You did. Uh, I've had, you know, I started teaching in 1979, but high school levels, it was 81, 82. And so some of my students are in their mid to late fifties and they'll tell me things like, you know, you said to us to these things, you, you, you told us this and I just couldn't hear you. I just, and now I just wish I could go back and be 17 again. And yeah. And I, I don't, I, you know, this is hard, Mark, cause I, I kind of wish I had this great answer for you. Yeah. You know, um, you know, there's this meme that keeps coming up on the Facebook that says, you know, uh, when I was in, I never once used uh, algebra in my life, but I wish they had talked to me about filling out tax forms in, in school. And I'm like, dude, you didn't pay attention because we did teach all that stuff. You just weren't listening. You know, uh, I learned, I mean, I taught my students, I brought, I brought in, a, I brought in, uh, I taught economics, history, and uh, sacred scripture. And I would bring in these people and I would show my students and I've actually had students tell me, you know, strangest thing, Mr. John, I was smarter at 17 than I am at 37. And we go, well, okay. It's just, it is, I hate to say it's the way of the world. And, but 
let's come on, Mark. We can't do this to the audience. Let's let's come on. Let's let's prod out some help here. Okay. Okay. Help. Ask me again. Let's see if I can come up with something positive. Okay. So it's like, how do we? Okay. Here's the question for us as coaches: How do we make quadrant three and what that represents sexy? Because that's what it is. Like, I need to be able to sell people on a path that's steady, that works, that fits their needs. It doesn't turn them into James Bond, but it gives them a really damn good life that they love. And it's like, you would think just saying that would be enough, but they're like, but I kind of want to be James Bond still. And it's like, (laughs) do you know what I'm saying? I I spend my life with, I mean, you know, uh, you know, when I work with the military and I I see that, these guys who want to train like Navy SEALs and it's like, dude, join the Navy, you know, don't, don't be like, you can't be like LeBron. You, you, you can't, Oh, I'm going to do this. I saw LeBron was doing uh, box squats. If I do box squats, I'll make, I'll be the leader of the LA Lakers. Really? That's you. you and that's the, that's the kind of the issue I, I run into a little bit. All right, Mark, how do you sell this stuff? Here, here's something that came up to me. All right. That just popped in my head. I think what people are sold on is exceptionalism. They want to be exceptional. Everyone wants to be elite in some form or another. And I think really what it, maybe it comes down to is helping people form a picture of an elite them. Like if you take all of the circumstances of your life and you create the most ideal version of that person who is the truly the best father, who is the 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 best in his shape for the amount of time and energy he can put into his fitness. And like you you it's almost like it needs to be a collaborative, creative sort of thing where because it comes down to the vision. It comes down to the goal. It's like you need to have a goal that's compelling realistic and you know sorry 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 um i got it sorry sorry that's all good speak of navy seals okay i'll call them right (laughs) but yeah i think i think it comes down to being able to to make them fall in love with a a vision of exceptionalism that is actually integrated and possible for them yes and and you know oscar wilde said the same thing about a hundred years ago you know you got to be yourself everybody else has been taken you know, and I, I think you're exactly right. Uh, one of the things that helped me is I think when I finally kind of embraced this, I must have been maybe a, maybe a sophomore in college when I realized I, this is as tall as I was going to get. This face was this is the face you got. Right. Uh, the, your ability. And I sort of decided and it's a tough it's a tough one. Um you know, we've done so many things in my career to, to help along, but we did a thing in theology one time in a, in a, in a, in a, I was getting a advanced degree in, in uh, ministry. And what the person that, that we had to do a series of assignments where you, they gave you literally crayons. I'm in a master's class and I've got crayons. And one of the things they asked you to do was, you know, draw your life story. And you only had, you had to do it in a piece of paper like this. Mm-hmm. And most of us began, you know, and it said it starts here and then the journey. And what was fascinating is as we got finished with this particular assignment, almost everybody had this cathartic moment where you look. And by the way, folks, it's not a bad thing to do. You have this cathartic moment where you finish and you go, that was, there's some highs and lows in my life. And then you, and then you reach back. And one of the things that we were asked to do then was to go into depth on the lows. And then we had to do and then this came and we had to do it again at the Olympic training center, same assignment where you took the lowest points in your life and you had to write out and you don't want to write it out. You want it to be very sketchy. You don't want to do too much detail because it'll just wreck your day. And you wrote out and you started comparing your low moments of your life. And then you start to do and then part the next part, obviously, is you started looking at the high moments of your life. And here's the great insight for me, Mark. This is a game changer for me. People. Hmm. My lowest moments, I was alone. My highest moments, my mom and dad were in the stands up there. There was my sister and my nieces. There was Father Dan Derry. Boom, I throw the discus. My folks are sitting next to Coach Mon and uh Coach Mon later told me that uh, my dad had to wipe tears out of his eyes. My dad, the World War II veteran 
who was abandoned as a child cried because I threw the discus so far. Okay. Uh, another moment, you know, I'm really struggling one time at a competition and I remind myself it's people. And so I start to actively go talk to fans, to uh, non-competitors and rebuilt in myself internally. Now you're asking why are we doing all this? I think people have to sit down and figure out what makes them, uh, what, what the buttons in their life that make right. a good experience good and what a bad experience bad is. And if you're sitting here, if you're listening to us and you feel like you need to lose some, some body fat, you know, use your experiences as, as mine, you know, gold mine and dig through and pull out those things when you were successful, what were the things that made you successful? Maybe it was a coach like me with a towel around my neck and a whistle in my mouth saying, God damn it, you lazy bastard. Okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's what you need in your life. Or maybe it was, you might have found that your best moments is when you were a little bit gentler on yourself. You know, and that, I think, and I know that was a long-winded, but I believe in everything I just told you. And you'll notice, you'll notice, Mark, in my life, um, I try very hard to, to keep, you know, when we have Thanksgiving in our house, we have 45 people here in our house. It's okay? a lot. <laughs> so we just got in, in my wife and I, our, our idea in, in life is to keep buying more tables, you know, keep, keep, keep getting more chairs. Uh, it's, it's, it's no problem to buy another Turkey or you get another ham, you know? Oh, sorry. Uh, vegetarians up. I didn't offend. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> and make jokes. And, and so for me, sometimes you got to sit down, you got to know, you know, you got to know yourself. You got to know what, what makes your life better or worse, richer or poorer. Yeah. I love that. That, cause that's, that's part of, and I guess in some ways that's anyone who's in, who's trying to sell something. That's essentially what your marketing should do if it's authentic. It should help kind of guide people through those touchstone points and help you find, all right, this is this is where you got your hurt, you know, and this is where we can maybe direct you. And I think it's like there's a balance that needs to be struck between thinking with small, reasonable steps, but having like a truly long-term goal. So it's like, yes, tiny habits, small shifts, super reasonable. But something that always struck me is like, you know, if it's if it just stays small, like what's the point? I don't care that much if it's that just oh, a small deal, you know. Oh no, it it doesn't stay small. Right. It's like the the thing that I think is most compelling, like the vision that has always struck me the most is I think it's Ignatius of Loyola talking about like the imitation of Christ. It's like you're literally supposed to become Jesus in your context, and you think about that, it's like what the heck with holy smokes, that's whoo, that's all that's big, and it's like. If you t say, if that's the end goal and you can only take tiny steps to get there, that seems to be the tension, I think. Wow, yeah, but think of the number of cliches and every person in the place is going to roll their eyes. The journey of a thousand steps, a mile starts with the first step. <laughs> you know, we just, you've been bombarded by these cliches since you were a child. But the funny thing is, just because it's a cliche doesn't mean there's not truth to it. So, right. So tiny steps. Every night before I go to bed, I write out my to-do list and I make coffee because coffee wakes the smell of coffee literally wakes me up in the morning. Mm -hmm. I combine that 366 times this year and I'm going to get a lot of good night's sleeps with a clear head because my to-do list has already been to done. Mm. Okay. Um, if I eat eight different vegetables every day for the next 366 days, good things are going to happen from that. If I get my work, you know, the, but the idea is, what a lot of people miss, and that's why being a track and field athlete, and I hate to say this, it might be true in swimming too. The nice thing about being a track and field athlete is, yeah, the world record's 243, but last year I threw 103, and this year I threw 129. I'm already throwing, that's not, I'm just, this is an example, folks, I throw much farther than that. Uh, that means I'm on the path. The beauty of track and field is so that- So measurable. And Olympic lifting and power lifting. And that's, right. I think that's why one of the reasons I've been drawn to them. I got a young man. He's uh, right now he snatches 135, but his goal is to snatch 225 because he won one big plate. His goal is to snatch two big plates. And he thought, is it a reasonable goal? And I, I said, it's one of the best goals I've heard in, in years because he's a 135 snatcher. Hmm. 
So all we got to do is just add 90 pounds. Now, if we add, you know, if we do this, this, and this, this will happen, that will happen. We'll get a little more flexible, a little more mobile. We'll get a little more powerful off the floor. We'll get strong. And right. all of a sudden, you knit together this thing. And the next thing you know, and it's not going to take very long at all, he's going to snatch 225 overhead. Yeah. I love that. I love trying to find those goals that just like they, they force everything into alignment. Like I'll tell you my goal. You can tell me if you think it's a good one. I want to be able to do a freestanding full depth handstand push up. Well, sure. And I, I weigh two thirty and I'm six, four. So it's like, that'll, that'll hope that'll probably, I can probably overhead press like one eighty right now. So that's like a three to four year goal probably for me. Uh -huh. Three to four a week. You just got to practice it. <laughs> you think? I can't even handstand yet. I've been trying for months. Well, do you have walls? Yeah. Put your feet up on a wall. I'm trying, man. I'm okay, trying. I'm working toward it. And, okay. Do you know how to walk a wall? Okay. Get in a push-up position. Uh huh. And then you bring your feet. Okay. Okay. So here's the wall here. Mm -hmm. Your head's this way. You put your feet on the wall, and you walk up the wall with your feet. And as okay. you're walking up the wall, you push back with your hands. That's how I used to teach my high school kids how to do handstands. Really? You do that. Yeah, you do that. You're, so your freshman year, you get up. I usually to, do the kick up the other way. That yeah. is it better to do the walk up? No, I'm just saying this is the, this okay. is how So your freshman year, you're walking up backwards and you get there and, you know, you look kind of and then you do the opposite way. And then we do a little game where you go. Uh, oh, yeah. It's called marching in place where left hand, right, left, your left come up, your right okay. comes up. By the time you're a senior, you do a, a shoulder roll or a, pardon me, a somersault into a handstand. You stay there for a moment and you break out and you do a, a roll out of it. Okay. And because, because you're just practicing, mm. you're just getting a little better. You're not, right. you know, and the nice thing about your goal, and I like that kind of goal, by the way, is you're going to find that your improvement is going to reflect life. Mm. Not what I do in the weight room. Everybody thinks they're going to come in with me the first week. Bench 135 this week, 145 next week, 155 next week. At the end of the year, 700 pounds. That's what they think. But the truth is life goes kind of, you know, it's got those peaks, plateaus, those valleys, those, those cliffs. Uh, and you're going to find that you're going to make weird progress one day. Yeah. Weird progress. Like I've had that at different points in my life where it's like all of a sudden it's, it's, it's happened with business. It's like all of a sudden, like last year I went from, it took me six years to get to 20,000 YouTube subscribers. And then by the end of the year I had over 60,000. So it's like, so it's like, you know, it's like an overnight success, six years in the making kind of thing. And it's like that, it seems like that's, I don't know, that's the way progress works sometimes. I don't know if you've ever heard of Tom Plummer, but he always, he, he includes my face in slides all the time. <laughs> And he always says, Dan John was an overnight success. It just took him 40 years to do it. <laughs> Perfect. You know, yeah, do, that's what it I, takes. Because I do, I mean, I do well and people go, I never heard of you. Now I own. It's like, well, yeah, but what do you think? I just sit around smoking dope all the time, you know, <laughs> sitting, sitting on street corners, you know, hanging out, you know, singing songs and, you know, like they do in Rocky, you know. <laughs> you know? What do you think I did, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I got one more kind of serious question. And then if you're interested to do some, some rapid fire ones. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. So the, the one that I'm interested in here is like, if you were going to try and make physical training into a spiritual discipline, yeah. how would you approach that? Okay. So now here's the problem you have. I am, I am, <laughs> I am an absolute believer in uh, Western civilization. I have mm -hmm. no division between mind, body, soul, and spirit. Mm -hmm. So for me, and it's funny, uh, he died. In fact, uh, uh, this uh, this band around my wrist that I carry all the time, he, he died on August 6th, uh, 2000, uh, pardon me, August 11th, uh, uh, 2006 with the, uh, uh, oh, let me check that, I'm sorry. August 6th, 2011, I apologize with a whole other group of guys, uh, 20, I knew 22 of them, but in our last emails, uh, that we had, uh, John and I were discussing, um, this who's this guy? I'm sorry. Uh, he was, a uh, he worked for the military. Oh, okay. And, uh, in our last emails together, we, we talked about this idea 
of of, of the he, he had this idea of being the, a, a warrior monk about how being a a, a top end military person and how important it was for him to have his spiritual side locked down so that he he wouldn't rip apart one day um and i have in my athletic career had those moments uh, uh a real quick example is we're playing westmore high school they break the huddle and i look and i know exactly they're breaking the huddle and I know what they're about to run on offense. And I realign where I'm going to go so I can be there when, literally when the ball carry gets the ball. And we met, at a, at, well, we collided at the moment he got the ball in his hands. I've had those moments, those spiritual moments in life that, that transcend um, uh, logic. Um, you know, when, some, when you try to explain the birth of your child, you know, you sort of run out of. There's no. There's not a great way to say it. Right. Uh, when you when you speak at your brother's funeral, it's it's difficult to summarize your um, your experiences in a way that the audience will understand. So for me, when I'm doing <laughs> when I'm doing eight goblet squats followed by a prowler followed by eight push-ups. And, I'm, and I've done this 19 times and I have one more, I reach inside myself to, to places that uh, aren't about my waistline or my, my, my armacondas or my... I reach into a place that is spiritual, that is, that is the warrior monk that I think is inside me. Um, I don't, I'm not a big fan of cutting, uh, in fact, uh, this, this, you know, m my concern is, you know, uh, I, I, if you want to go, if you want to go corny, we can go with the yin yang sign, but in the yin yang, there's those dots of black and white, mm -hmm. you know, um, in fact today at the, today at Red Cross, uh, the, the young lady asked my gender and I said, <laughs> I said something along the lines of, I don't like to define myself that exactly, but you know, which makes me as, as being male, there is, I do have a feminine side that allows me to be around females. And if I didn't have some, we, you, you can't, you cannot interact with total other, hmm. you know, um, the reason I think humans get along so well with dogs, this is the second time I mentioned dogs, is there's so, something human about dogs. There's something, in fact, the bulk of the dogs I know are better than the bulk of the people I know. Uh, <laughs> so to me, I, to, to, to get into the spiritual dimension of a training session to me is, is, is very natural and very easy because I acknowledge it. And sometimes when I'm working with somebody who isn't getting their physical goals, and I'm not saying you have to go to church or anything like that, but what I'm saying is they've tried to break their life off into this is my body this is what i do for a living this is how i make my money and over here i'm a father a mother and over here i'm a neighbor and to me whew, i try to dan john who's a grandfather uh, my you know if i were to die right now one of the videos i'd like you to look at is me teaching my grandson danny right there we had parallel bars and i was teaching l sits on the parallel bars mm. To me, that's one of the best grandfather moments of my life. You know, that, and there's another picture of us riding our bikes and Josephine and my granddaughter together. And there's, we're all on our bikes like this. And right. we wrote something like, you know, what kind of trouble are you looking for? Whatever, I don't know. But to me, my physical, my grandparental, my, all that stuff is, is, is one. And if, if I would have any advice for people who are struggling with their with their fitness, their their health, their longevity goals, is very often you've you turn your workout into now I'm going to get tired physically and throw up like you said earlier. <laughs> now it's time to throw up. Well, I can guarantee your stomach isn't interested in that. Your esophagus has no interest in you throwing up. It's not good for the esophagus. So you're not even following your own physical rules. 
But there are going to be times when you work out so hard that there'll be a moment of clarity. And by the way, uh, the re how I write so many books is because I exercise. My exercising makes my book my book writing easier. Because hmm. you know? I'll be out. Tiff says it's funny sometimes because we'll be doing something. We'll be in the middle of Disneyland. And I'll start making a note on my phone. And she said, what happened? I go, it's, it's, uh, um, it's just, just, yeah. And I'm embarrassed to admit that being in Disneyland made something link up in my head. I hope that answered. Okay. I apologize. Oh no, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. It's like, you know, the, the kind of cliche tongue in cheek response people give to something like that sometimes is like, well, my body is a temple. Uh, and they're kind of, you know, say it half jokingly. Some people will say it pretty seriously, but like, I've thought about that concept a lot. And, you know, since I'm, I do a lot of work in like the sexual realm and sexual self mastery, it's like the, the topic of transmutation comes up. And that's really what like, like you think about the purpose of a temp temple, usually in most traditions, it's a place where sacrifice is performed. Yeah, and it's like any kind of discipline is a sacrifice. It's just like, you know, instead of lighting, you know, a piece of meat on fire and having the smoke rise up to God, you're sacrificing something you want, which is usually some kind of comfort. And then that pain, it kind of burns inside of you. And there's some, there's a transforming effect if it's a good sacrifice. And it's like, I guess you can kind of look at physical training like that. It's like you're training yeah. sacrifice and sacrifice is how you get basically everything good. And if you try to line that up to good things, then, you know, I don't know if there's a better skill to, to perfect. When you talk to an Olympic lifter and someone steps <laughs> on a bar, it's considered offensive because the bar is sacred, which has the same root as sacrifice. Hmm. And I think you're right. And I think one of the things, you know, I'm a big believer that you should have s certain places in your life that are in, in this room, we do this, in this room, we do that, in this room, we did this. And I believe strongly in my gym, for example, that it's a, it's a, it's a, say, it, I hate to call it, I wouldn't call it a church. I, I actually refer to it as a, like a learning hospital, mm. a teaching hospital. Okay. But it, it's, what we're trying to do in my in my gym, it's a sacred space where we try to teach people, try to help people become better coaches, uh, better trainers, and and if you're not a better a better human. Right. So yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, that's good. That's very good. Cool. Awesome. Well, this has been super fun. So now I've got just a a set of kind of random questions I wanted to hit you with. Go. Cool. So all right, you mentioned in your quote you know, reread good books. What are some books that you've reread a bunch oh. of times? Well, the sword and the stone, probably 50 to hundred times, mm. uh, Beau Gest, which is a great book, uh, Dune many times, Godfather many times, mm. uh, the whole canon of uh, Sherlock Holmes, um, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, Beowulf many times, many, many times. Um, so those are the books in that kind of, uh, and then in, uh, in our world, Tommy Kono's weightlifting, uh, weightlifting Olympic, comma, Olympic style, uh, way too many times. Uh, the book Spring Chicken, which came out a couple years ago by a guy named Guilford. Um, boy, this, I, this gonna, people can get mad at me. Uh, there's Sun Tzu over there uh, on my hot list. Uh, Lots and lots of other books. Uh, lots. And I'm lots sure. Of yeah, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was just curious which ones came off the top of your head. Thank you. I'll have to. I, I, I haven't done the classics nearly enough that yeah. you mentioned. Would you do those for school or did you just do those on your own accord? For my own accord. I would also, I mean, I always tell people Genesis. I mean, my, I could write a book on Genesis 4 by itself and uh, by itself. Uh, which story is that? Uh, Cain and Abel. Oh, right. Yeah, and then uh, one through four, you could also include. I've read those uh, 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 so many times, and so yeah, so those would be those would be the ones I believe in. Re yeah. But here's the thing, and uh, I was at a I was one time at a, at a meeting with Ar the late Archbishop Niederauer, and uh, he talked about rereading a, a section of a book, and the joke was it was the four. Uh, it's in a book like Sense and Sensibility, maybe the. The, the father is a pastor and he has a sermon called the 491st sin. 
because you know you're supposed to forgive seven times 70. Mm -hmm. so and he goes i never i never caught the joke (laughs) until you read it and then there's a there's a scene in the sword and the stone which i consider the saddest moment in in literature Uh, merlin simply says to arthur so soon he has just asked arthur how long have you been here and he said half an hour well merlin lives backwards in time and they've been together a long, long time. So the first time they meet is going to be Merlin's last time. So he says, so soon. Ah. I had to read that book so many times to understand the pain of that moment. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, th- that's all the best art does, though, is it like it'll preoccupy you and it's like a little time bomb. And then once you see what they did and it clicks, it's just like. Exactly. Right? exactly. <laughs> or when you tell somebody that this is what the word means in Hebrew or this is what the word means uh, in Latin or something like that. <clears throat> and this whole section just goes, oh, I totally miss. Oh, oh. Right. Okay. Oh wow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like one one of the times that ha- like some, something like that happened to me was when um you know Jesus he's you know he says you know God why have you Father why have you forsaken me and then I found out that that was actually the first line of a Psalm from the Old well, Testament Psalm twenty two right I didn't know that and then that entirely changes those words I thought he was despairing but it was like even in the, his dying breath he was like it's you the, know the trial and uh, triumph of Messiah Psalm twenty two right if, 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 next time you reread Mark <clears throat> Psalm twenty three is the first half of Mark and Psalm twenty two is the second half of Mark they're just you're just throwing out huh, Sorry. interesting that's what you get when you interview someone who's got a sacred scripture. <laughs> Are you are you are you Catholic? Yeah, I'm a fish eater. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So am I. It's always nice to meet uh, other Catholics. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So if gentle <laughs> listener doesn't. It's not good. At yeah. Talking. Yeah. Right. I, I feel like you know. I, I. It's it's harder for me a lot of times to say that I'm Catholic than to say that I was like a porn addict uh, online, ah! which is. The last frontier of ism in the United States is still, I think, religion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll stop there. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, Okay. So this one's for my uh, assistant, kind of right hand man guy. I want you to tell me why shouldn't he just bench press and do arm day every single workout? You tell him he's do it all he wants. (laughs) But don't be disappointed when your lack of progress shows up very soon. Okay. All right, so it's really just a limitation, right? And, and then maybe also, some some health on shoulders. If we play a pickup bass or football game, and I'm schooling you at age 62, when you try to come up the line of scrimmage, even though you look better in your tank top, you ain't going anywhere. But I'll slap you around like a ten year old. But other than that, it's fine. Okay, great. Um, okay. Uh, Really heavy kettlebells. Are they worth it? Like I've I've recently bought some kettlebells. I'm obsessed with them, and now I want to get some of those big fat monster bells. Are they worth it? No, I don't think so. Ah, you, okay. Your technique has to be so locked down to swing a 48. Uh, I'm a master kettlebell instructor. I have I would what people say is very very good technique. Uh, I'm one rep from blowing it out uh, with the 48. With two hands? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm just saying. I'm just telling you. Okay. The and then the other thing is you're going to have this 60 kilo thing sitting around all the time. And you're going to constantly ask yourself, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Fair here's, enough. Here's what, you, here's what you need. Most people, men need a 20. Most women need a 10. Uh, I would say six, for men, 16, 24, 32 after that. Okay. Fair then, enough. Then, go then, learn the, then learn the Olympic lift, I guess, if I want to, to do. All right. Come by and I'll teach it all to you. Yeah. All right. I- Sounds good. All right. Then, okay, this one, if this uh, this could be a long answer, go ahead and make it a short one if it's if possible. Um, so what does strength training for a runner look like and then running for a strength trainer look like? Like for well, someone general fitness, quadrant three. Uh, I would go back to Percy uh, Saruti or Saruti, uh, whatever they want to call him this week. He believed that uh, runners should press, deadlift, pull up, what he called a cheek curl, which we would call a curl grip uh, cr- uh, clean, mm-hmm. and he ab work, ab work. Uh, do those three days a week, two to five, three, uh, two sets of five, 
try to be able to press body weight, try to be able to deadlift body weight. Running for a strength athlete, uh, we're going to have to – running is going to have to be measured mm-hmm. depending on, because of the si- the volume. you got to – you know, you, uh, jogging probably never, sprinting uh, – hill sprints by God two days a week. Everyone in the world should hill, hill sprint or do sled pulls if you don't have hills. Uh, but, yeah, so I do think that, that cardiovascular work helps. Personally, I'd rather see a, a, a big engine – uh, riding a bicycle or mm-hmm. doing rucking or something like that, because every time my foot hits the ground jogging, that's twenty six hundred pounds of force going through my body, yeah. and that's in and of course if I if I do this or that with my feet, if I if it hit funny, it's on my hips. Quality running is would be the key, and I always think uh, if you have an option, long walks, sprints. Okay, and I, yeah, I was Mike and I do that. I think you'll like is we have a little, it's called Wheeler Farms right over there. Do we have a little loop? You sprint up the hill, walk the loop, sprint up the hill, walk the mm. loop. Uh, it's, that's, you, I've never had an athlete get hurt sprinting up a hill. I like that. Cause I, I went like, I'm, I'm a super bad runner. Like I was a good athlete, good basketball yeah. player, good high jumper, but I could not run. Like I'm a big guy. I got real dense bones, no endurance. Like I did cro- one season across country and all the girls were faster than me and i was like a varsity basketball player so i just don't have the long distance so i'm trying to figure out should i like what would be a good mile like time goal for me or is that something i just shouldn't even worry about and just stick with the sprinting why don't you do this instead uh look up uh phil maffy tones he's got this test it's called the math test m-a-f where you go to you go to a track the first time Mm -hmm. and you walk a mile but you have to keep your heart rate 180 minus age and 160 minus age. You have to keep your heart rate in those two things and you time your walk. Hmm. So mile one, you walk it in eight minutes, mile two, eight minutes and 20 seconds, mile three, 12 minutes. Okay. Mm-hmm. You're, sorry, going up. Once that thing beep, 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 you slow down. And his argument is three months later, you do the test and, you're at seven and a half, seven and a half, and nine. You've made really good progress in your cardiovascular system, and you're probably a fat burner now, not a sugar burner. Hmm. So I recommend if you're gonna, and if you don't, just look it up. If you can't find it, I'll help you. The M A F test from Phil Maffetone. A person I'd rather, and that's a good way to judge if your cardiovascular work is truly impacting your <laughs> cardiovascular system and cool. your, your fat burning. Very awesome. simple test. But cool. you do an accurate heart rate monitor and the courage to walk 12 laps. <laughs> okay. All right. I can do that. Just get a good podcast, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And I think that's most of them. Final question. What's it like having two first names? In sports, they call you Dan or they call you John? Well, there's a theory. My brother used to make fun of me because when I played high school football, I was always credited with every tackle. Now, I used to think it's because I made every tackle, but he used to say, well, actually, they, the, the announcer was going, on the tackle, Tasa Saf-. So I had a teammate named Tasa Sofia Tafiona and another teammate named Satoga Satoga. And they'd look at those numbers and go, Top, Dan John on the tackle. <laughs> uh, announcers always call me Dan John. So I okay. uh, it's the hardest thing is when you're at the bank and they say, what's your last name? And you say, John, and they say, no, your last name. And you say, I'm 62 years old. I know my last name. So that, <laughs> that one, just, it, it's a bit of an irritant. It is a bit of a rub. Okay. But, I mean, worse things have happened in my life. I can handle it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, at least people can always pronounce your name. That's a, that's that's a plus side. That's true. <laughs> okay. Well, um, thank you so much. I think, you know, the, the final thing we can say here is, guys, if you want to learn more about uh, Dan, Check out his books. Look up Dan John on Amazon. He's got a ton there. Um, something for anything you want in terms of fitness. Uh, and then, additionally, uh, Dan's got a new website out. Tell, tell us a little bit about the, the website. Well, I've been. Tr- God bless Brian. He's the guy. He's the brains behind it. Brian has been reading my books for years. Trains the way I recommend people train. He he. It, it, according to him, it was a game changer in how he feels and looks. And so. But he's also an expert on this the, the, the backside of the internet stuff. 
So it's called danjohnworkouts.com. But the thing is, there's a, there's a workout mod, uh, uh, generator there where it goes with the way you should do things. First, you tell us what equipment you have. Kettlebell, dumbbell, exercise, whatever it is. Then you click, you just, you just touch them and it, you know, you pick them. And then how many days a week do you want to work out? Okay. Uh, how long, you got a one to 10 scale of, you know, where you're at right now. Do you want to improve your workouts or not? Half hour workouts or hour workouts. And then you press a button. And if you said five workouts a week, whew, it shoots up five workouts. Now, the cool thing is, if it says air, pardon me, air squats on Wednesday, but you feel like really going for it, you can go up, 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 up in the in the movement selection to make that exercise harder and not harder and harder, but more and more complex. Right. And, and I love, and it's like the first time he showed it to me, I was like, okay, you are inside my brain when I'm trying to talk to someone online about changing. I'll get an email, Dan, which I do for workout. I want you to snatch and clean and jerk. I don't have, I don't have a barbell. Okay. Uh, kettlebell snatch swing and blah, blah, blah. I don't have a kettlebell. Okay. Uh, you know, I honestly, you think I'm joking. This is a true story. Dan, I want to do the big 21 program, but I don't have a barbell. Well, it's an Olympic lifting program. Yeah. So what should I do? Well, I, I want to be an Olympic swimmer, but I don't have any water near me. Okay. What, what do you want me to do? Can you give me an exercise thing? Yeah, stand in place and go like this with your arms. Your arms. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a super cool website, um, and it also has videos for each of the thing that yeah. shows you how oh, each you each one that. works. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's got it's everything. It's, the exercise it shows it to you. Yeah, yeah, and it's got uh, what about twelve uh, bookish kinds of things you can download. Mm -hmm. And then about what about two three essays a week that I write for it, which is kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, and it's we have a thing set up where if you sign up and you use the code, we'll we'll have below here. You can get a discount oh. on uh, the the membership. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I I was talking with your your partner and uh, oh, we, yeah. we set that up. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you know, if you guys want to check that out, it's really great resource if you're looking to get started with stuff you can make it really easy or if you're pretty advanced you can you can crank it up and you're oh, gonna yeah, yeah. The, the big 21 workout call me when you're done yeah 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 so i've done a bunch of dance programs i love them um the website's really sick i actually haven't seen anything like that in any kind of app so you know I, I'm, I'm happy to be you know part of this thanks so much thanks so much well, I think that's that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for coming on, Jan. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your time, man. Really appreciate. It. I know, I, I know. I tend to go on a little bit, and I know I tend to go off on my little tangents. But whenever I go off on a tangent, it's because I worry that if you don't have the whole answer, you're going to miss the point. So I appreciate <laughs> that. You're like me. I totally. Uh, I, it's it's hard to rein it in when you got a good point and you want to make sure they just they see the whole thing, right? Well, could you imagine having an interview? <laughs> what should I drink? Water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of the things. Maybe we'll we'll end it on this, and if you you can tell me if you agree, is that I found that the simpler the concept is, usually the more profound and powerful it is. But then the more complexity you need to add to it, so that the brain can actually grab it and use it. Yeah. And that's that's kind of the 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 weird challenge of being trying to be a better and better teacher. Is like, how can I make something sim super simple, but then complex enough to actually be compelling? Sometimes it's called simplexity. <laughs> that's a good way. I haven't heard that. That's a good one. Oh, well, and there's, there's, yeah, and it's sometimes called BS. Uh, <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, hey, Mark, I appreciate it. It's, uh, it's been a delight. All right. Well, thank you. We'll talk again, I hope, soon, okay? Definitely. All, All right. right. Talk soon. Bye -bye. See you then. Bye. Most guys fail to build good habits because they're stuck in bad thought patterns. Until you recondition your brain to think new thoughts in the moments that matter, you'll keep ending up in the same old places over and over again. This is why I created the Metascript Method. It's a free guide that will teach you three simple yet insanely powerful journaling techniques that, when practiced regularly, will reprogram your brain for near automatic success. I've read hundreds of client journals in my years as a professional coach, and I've identified exactly what you need to put down on the page if you want to create positive life changes that truly stick. And no, just endlessly writing about your feelings doesn't work. So if you want to learn my secret weapons of self-development, then click the link below and grab your free copy of The Metascript Method now.